Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. By golly gosh, we've got a lot of stuff to go through on a Sunday. Let's start things out with AM5, shall we? Executable Fix on Twitter. I'll, of course, link his account. It's actually leaked some first details regarding AM5. And perhaps the most surprising of all of these details is that it's going to be utilizing PCIe Gen 4 and not Gen 5. He believes that Gen 5 is only going to be for the server market, which is definitely a stranger decision by AMD, but let's have a quick look at the tweet first. He states that, of course, it's AM5, LGA1718, so for those keeping count, that's 18 pins more than what uh, Intel have on their new socket. 18 pins, that will make all the difference. Dual channel DDR5 memory, again, PCIe Gen 4. And unsurprisingly, this is the 600 series chipset. Again, he states that uh, no PCIe Gen 4, it looks like it's only for Genoa, but rather interestingly, the socket size itself of the CPU remains identical, so 40 by 40. Personally, I had heard it was PCIe Gen 5, but maybe those were early plans and they changed. I mean, to be honest with you, Executable Fix has a pretty good track record, so I am willing to say that he's probably right on this one. It's also possible that my source got confused with Gen 4 and 5 based on, of course, the server as well as the desktop are both utilizing uh, the Zen 4 microprocessor architecture. Either way, it's an interesting decision by AMD to do this. After all, they have tons more memory bandwidth thanks to DDR5 memory, which is cranking up to insane clock frequencies. And obviously you can get like 4800 uh, MTS uh, memory. And we're even seeing some reports of way north over 6000. So obviously memory bandwidth is going to be very important for the next generation of uh, Zen processors. But yeah, I mean, actually, I suppose if you think about it in terms of GPUs, they won't be utilizing most likely Gen 5 for a while. Although I'll be very interested to see what the effects are of um, things such as sampler feedback or memory bandwidth requirements. If you have, let's say an RTX 3070 or a 6800 XT, they do okay. They do lose a little bit of performance from shifting from uh, PCIe Gen 4 to uh, 3, but it's nothing terrible. So again, I'll be interested to see what happens um, if we were to compare, let's say, uh, a game really like maximizing the usage of um, sample feedback on Gen 4, Gen 5, as well as Gen 3, it would be very interesting, I think. Personally, I am hearing really good things, though, of the Ryzen 6000, which I'm assuming what these things are going to be called. We've discussed IPC and how Ryzen 6000 is just going to absolutely trounce everything that the market has to offer. And I'm still very confident that this is the case. Quite frankly, Older Lake is going to get absolutely destroyed. And I think this is probably going to be one of the bigger leaps in the Zen architecture. And that's actually very impressive because, you know, you can argue that the smallest leap was probably like Zen to Zen Plus. It was a modest upgrade, but did give AMD a little bit more firepower to compete with uh, Intel's refresh at the time. But now it's like they're just executing every single generation of Zen with such success, it's it's actually very impressive. And next up, RDNA 3 as well as RTX 40. Code 57 Kimi has a really good track record and has linked a couple of very interesting things concerning these upcoming GPUs. As always with any leak, you should definitely take them with a few pinches of salt, but there are some interesting things here. So first of all, RDNA 3 is going to be on the 5NM process, which I think most of us would agree that it's, it's almost certain that this is the case. They're not going to be uh, producing them on, let's say, 6NM from TSMC or anything like that. And it's definitely not going to be on 3NM simply because of the time uh, factor that they're going to be releasing, or rather the time frame that they're going to be releasing these things in. AD102 is in, tra is in transition, or maybe GH202 in revolution. Now, again, I discussed this in yesterday's video, but I have been hearing from a couple of sources that it's possible that we will not see Lovelace for the GeForce lineup. Instead, we will see possibly an Ampere refresh. Now, I'm not really certain whether this is the case, but if it is, I would be very interested to see what differences there are, because I am hearing that the performance leap in terms of IPC is very impressive. Um, I'm hearing that NVIDIA are targeting over a two times increase with RTX 40. Um, 
one figure that Copity is uh, floating around is about 2.2 times, and this does seem to match up with my own. It's around 2.1 to 2.3 was a figure that I've been hearing quite frequently. But again, compared to what I'm hearing for RDNA3, there's just there's just no comparison. Copity believes that we're going to be seeing over 2.5 times. And again, I, in yesterday's video, mentioned a 2.7 times increase if you're comparing the highest end skew, of course, which is absolutely ridiculous if you think about how that kind of compares to previous generations. Now, there are some architectures which definitely were perhaps a bigger leap, especially if you look at them in the grander scheme of things. I know this is an unpopular thing to say, but I personally believe that the RTX 20 is arguably one of the most important generations because it did bring things such as mesh shaders, ray tracing to developers to allow them to actually figure out how this stuff works. Now, arguably for customers, it didn't really mean so much, but I do believe for developers and stuff and pushing things forward in the market, it was extremely important. The Voodoo 2 is a great example of an architecture which is possibly even a bigger leap. I mean, for example, we saw double the clock frequency, the inclusion of a, a, a second TMU and all of those other changes which were so important at the time. And the Voodoo 2 was just ridiculous for such a long period. And other cards such as NVIDIA's uh, 80, I was about to say GTX, but no, 8800 GTX. NVIDIA did the switcheroo on the position of the GTX. And of course, that architecture was so important in terms of its ability to unify the graphics architecture. But even so, I do think that RDNA 3 is going to be incredibly important because of the chiplet-based nature. So kpt 7 Kimi does believe that we're looking at four GCDs for the highest end SKU, which I'm assuming is the one that is targeting 2.7 times increase over the highest end um, Narve 2X SKU. So that, of course, would be the 6900XC. But it's interesting from my point of view because the source who originally told me the chiplet names was backed up by a second source who also confirmed the names of the chiplets. This is a while ago. But then they told me that there were only two um, GCDs on the highest end SKU. But then other people, and I've mentioned this in a couple of videos previously, other people told me this is possibly untrue and there could be a higher number, for example, four. So I'm starting to lean more towards what Kopity is telling me. Interestingly, he also believes that it's possible we could be seeing up to double the number of uh, shaders or SIMD per CU as well, which would be definitely an easier way for AMD to increase the level of performance relative to the previous generation. Of course, the big question when you're doing something like that is actually trying to keep all of the uh, SIMD fed with data, right? You're trying to not only schedule the work across a whole myriad of different compute units, but not only do you need to schedule that work, but you actually need to feed all of it. So of course, this is one of the reasons that AMD have done what they have been doing with, let's say, the Infinity Cache, and we're probably seeing all of these patents with uh, active, um, active dies, or active bridges, excuse me. There's definitely a lot of questions still for what AMD are planning in terms of the broader ecosystem. And I feel that, you know, it's, it's not just in terms of the hardware itself. It's very easy to get excited about let's say, I don't know, uh, 18,000 CUDA cores or 2.4 gigahertz clock frequencies or 16 gigabytes of RAM or whatever. Those are cool things, but I also do feel that some of this is going to be kind of an ecosystem war as well. And again, I've said this in multiple videos, but NVIDIA definitely have a really big foothold in the market, for example, technology like DLSS, but then you also need to take into consideration that AMD does have the console market almost down, you know, kind of down to pat. I mean, yes, the Switch is selling very well, and I do think that that is going to be a very critical path for NVIDIA going forward, but it's going to be very interesting to me exactly how all of this plays out. And honestly, I don't think anyone can really predict what is gonna happen in the next couple of years, especially given we don't really know how these architectures perform with certain stuff that is upcoming. For example, it, just for example, if we were to compare mesh shaders on a 6800 XT versus an RTX 3080, which are roughly comparable in traditional rasterization performance, is it possible that one is massively slower than the other? I honestly don't know. 
And the same thing could be said for other technology as well, like sampler feedback and what is this going to mean going forward for other architectures. Basically, we're in a very interesting time in the market right now. And one of the really good things, of course, is that I do think we're starting to see the end of the, you know, the storm of GPUs. They're definitely still very difficult to procure for all of the reasons we all know about. I do feel that we're now starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Whether or not it happens for this year or whether it's next year, I don't really know. Um, but I do think changes like, for example, the LHR uh, GeForce cards, which are coming out, the fact that crypto uh, is getting absolutely wrecked at the moment, Possibly some positive things are happening. With all of that said though, thank you very much for listening to my rambling. If you've enjoyed it, then leave a thumbs up on the channel because, well, it's YouTube and the algorithm and you know what happens with the algorithm and thumbs up and stuff like that. But with that said, thank you very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.